There's a lot more you can do with it, which I hope to show a little bit later on. I'm also going to show up page redirection and cookie stealing, but let me check something. Yeah, I'm going to go to a demo to actually show that off. Now, the problem with doing live demos is sometimes things fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, anybody who's been to one of my classes realizes that real quick. Okay. To make things more convenient, rather than me sitting here typing in the different uh, cross type scripting attacks I'm going to use, uh, I'm just going to copy and paste them from this little simple text file I've created. Now, this is the canonical example of a cross-site scripting injection, uh, alert XSS. And I'm going to go in here, go into Mutilidae, and start it up. Like I said before, XAMPP is just a simple way of running this. You could run this on your Linux box with PHP if you really wanted to. I ran the wrong one. XAMPP just makes things a lot simpler. Got started. We'll start that. And now they have that running, and let's hope I didn't have, leave something silly up. Good. I'm going to go to target dot hack. Now, target dot hack is not a real domain. If anybody actually probably has figured that out, essentially I've uh, edited my local host file to map both of those to the um, local loopback address 127.0.0.1. I just figured it would be better to use domain names in this particular illustration than to use the IP addresses. I've also set up attacker.hack just to show you that it'd be like two different domains are interacting with each other. Keep in mind, however, ultimately they actually are actually feeding from the same web server, but this stuff will work across different domains. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up and reset the DB because I've probably done a lot of uh, testing in the background. That little link right there, what it does is it essentially blanks the database, reinitializes it, wipes out all the different SQL injections you've done, all the different cross-site scriptings you've done, anything that might screw things up. It absolutely wipes it. Also, if you go over to the credits information on here, there's a few special thanks for people. And you notice the OWASP chapter should be in here. Actually, I don't have the OWASP Louisville chapter, but I can change that in a future version. Um, another thing you can do is use the toggle hints link. What that does is it sets a cookie that whenever you go to some place, like let's say add to your blog, it puts a little highlighted in yellow section that explains what the vulnerability is and how to exploit it so that students can look at this and exploit the application. I'm going to go ahead and turn hints back off though because I won't be needing it for this. Now to illustrate that simple cross-site scripting attack that I was talking about before, I have one script on here that allows you to add to your blog. Now, I'm currently anonymous. I'm not logged in as anybody. But I can still add to my blog. The reason I can do this, now, if this application was implemented correctly, it would strip out all sorts of characters and script tags so that this wouldn't work. But since it allows, any, it allows uh, me to insert any text I want, and then it throws it into the database and displays it on the web page, it automatically runs the script. Now, this script's pretty simple. It just shows up XSS. And what I just showed is technically, I suppose, a reflected, a reflected cross-site scripting attack. There's two main types of cross-site scripting people talk about. One is reflected, one is stored. Reflected is something along the lines of you send someone a link, and someplace in the URL, it actually does the, inje the injection of the XSS, and when the person goes to view that link, it automatically attacks them. That's not as powerful, however, as stored cross-site scripting. Stored cross-site scripting is when it gets stored to a database someplace or a file or something else, and someone later on comes around, views the page, and then gets hit. For instance, uh, some of the MySpace worms that were going about around, those would be stored cross-site scripting. Someone injects into their own page, someone else visits their page, the code gets ran, and it goes and does something. Now, I'm going to illustrate stored cross-site scripting here in a bit. But all it takes is me logging in as someone else and then going to view Anonymous's blog, and that XSS script will pop up. For instance, if I went back to here, let's say view someone's blog, show everyone, boom, the cross-site script from ran. As I said before, this is kind of a sad thing that this was used as the uh, de facto 
example of cross-site scripting because it's only, it doesn't really show you the power of cross-site scripting. It gives you an impression that all you can do is annoy people. You can do much more. Now, I suppose if you want to be really annoying but still want to just test for cross-site scripting, um, I have a different injection that we can use. Let me go down here. <laughs> I wish I was go do this in this order. But I figured it'd be a good thing to illustrate. This is a simple cross-site scripting that's a little more complex. So I guess it's not simple. You can see it references an image, clippy.png, on attacker.hack. That's the attacker's website. Technically, it's running on the same box. But keep in mind, that this will work. And this isn't even technically a cross-site scripting attack since there's no real script involved. But it'll give you an example of, um, well, how many people out there have gotten a pop-up while you're web surfing around that says, you are infected with this virus? And they give you a little window that looks like a Windows window, but it's not really. And it says, hey, if you buy this, we can make it all go away. But when you actually do try to buy it, essentially, it gives you a free download maybe, and then it blackmails you to get rid of it. Well, you can do something like that with cross-site scripting. This might be a little more interesting thing to inject on somebody. Hello, it looks like you have an XSS vulnerability. Would you like some help fixing that? And I just have that link off to the OWASP website. That's a simple defacement sort of uh, cross-site scripting attack. I'm going to do something a little bit more insidious and useful. I'm going to reset my database so I get rid of all the attacks I've done so far. And let's say we want to do something more interesting. Let's talk about cookie stealing. Now, everybody here knows what a cookie is, correct? A little piece of data that, to, that the uh, service sends you to say, hey, store this. We might put credentials or some other settings on here so that we can establish continuity between the time you visited before and the time you're visiting now from page to page. By default, HTTP is stateless. And actually, one of the reasons there's so many different web vulnerabilities out there is because we do things with HTTP and HTML that was never really intended in the original design. This particular script, I'm going to explain what it does before I inject it. It creates a new image, and it points to attacker.hack, which is the attacker's website, and it points to a PHP script called catch.php. I wrote catch.php, and it comes with Mutilide. It's a really simple, stupid script that takes whatever someone sends it and stores it into a text file. And in this case, I'm using JavaScript to encode in the URI document.cookie. So I'm going to try to grab the cookie. So what I will do is copy that and um, go in here and inject it. I'm going to add to the anonymous blog that particular script. Boom. And well, you don't see anything because I didn't actually type any text that gets rendered. The script's actually in the background. Now, if I went to look at the log right now, it wouldn't be very interesting. So let me go ahead and log in as someone else. And in an alternate tab, I'm going to open up that text file. This is that little text file that was created on attacker.hack. I'm going to log in as, well, how many people here in John Strand? John Strand's on the Paul.com podcast, and also I met him at the uh, ISSA event, so I decided to create an account by default in his honor. So I'm going to log in as John Strand. And now I want to scroll on down, and I'm going to say, oh, I want to see what people's blogs are out there. Well, I'm going to look at admin. Oh, that's not very interesting. Let me just see everybody. That way it shows Anonymous' blog as well. Huh, Anonymous said nothing. That's not very interesting. Well, let me move back here to the attacker's website where the JavaScript had sent the cookie. Hopefully this works. And you see show hints is set to zero. That's because I turned hints off at some point in time. And user ID is three. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk much about weak session management. I will talk about it a little bit right here. The way this thing handles sessions is everybody has a user ID. Admin starts off with one. I think I'm number two, John's number three, and so forth. All I do to set up sessions is throw a cookie out there with that session, with, with that particular user ID, and the user ID is the session ID. This is an incredibly dumb idea. But I designed Matilda to be weak. So you see there, I grabbed the cookie. You could grab the cookie from some other website.